Hello, and welcome to the Ketogenic Diet Show. My name is Mary Beauchamp. I'm a registered nurse, therapeutic nutritionist, and ketogenic diet coach. And I am delighted to interview Ruby today. She's going to be sharing with us a little bit about her health journey with the ketogenic diet in her life and how she's been able to implement this even though she is a student at a university she did this living in a dorm room and now she lives in a tiny house she's amazing and she has such an incredible story to tell and I, i'm excited to share it with the world because i know that it's going to impact a lot of people so ruby welcome to the show she's a senior now in college and i'm just delighted that she's here so I'm going to hand it over to Ruby and just ask you to sort of share a little bit about how you got started on the keto journey and what sort of changes have you seen in your life over the last five years after doing this? So I want to say that I've gone back and forth doing a lot of diets really starting in eighth grade. Um, I think that was when I became more self-conscious of my body and my appearance and really started using my diet as a way to control that. Um, and then I got into keto in high school when I started wrestling and needing to control my body weight um, to make weight for tournaments. And I was very adamant about tracking all my food, track my, ca my carbs, my fats, my proteins, calories, um, I would even weigh out food and I kept a journal logbook of all the food that I ate um, and also kept track of my exercise because uh, I was going to morning practices on a weekly basis and then had daily wrestling practices. And I started in a 120 weight class and dropped all the way down to 106 when I was wrestling um, with exercise and eating keto really strictly. I'm also doing intermittent fasting and that kind of a thing. Um, so that was really my first experience of keto, and I would say that it was a huge success. It really helped me maintain my energy um, throughout my wrestling season, um, and I lost weight and felt amazing. I felt super fit. Um, I just want to say, too, that that was before the era of app trackers for different macros and things like that, right, Ruby? So you were actually doing yeah. this by hand with pen and paper tracking your macros, which is really quite extraordinary. We have so many tools now to use that are so helpful. And oftentimes I have people say, you know, I can't track my macros or it's too hard or it's too much of a pain. But the truth is, if you do not track your macros, you will never know what is going on with your body. So it's so important that you are tracking your ketones and your macros in, I recommend Chronometer. Chronometer is the easiest app to use and it's the one that I recommend and that I use with all of my clients. So Ruby did not have access to these tools back then. This was, what, five years ago? Yeah, their chronometer and other apps probably were out, but I just wasn't using them. And that was also before I knew to test my ketones or blood sugar or any of that. So I was kind of um kind of just doing it off the cuff, but um it worked. Yeah, and this was also something that was fairly new to the athletic community in that it, there was still a huge mentality around carb loading and yeah and everybody carb load like I remember when Thanksgiving came around and my coach just told everybody to eat as many potatoes as you possibly can and everybody would carb load before um tournaments and I would normally I would I wouldn't I just like have a smoothie or soup broth and then there's also a, a whole culture around wrestling that has to do with basically starving yourself before you weigh in. Yeah, that part was super intense. I mean, there'd be people spitting in a bottle on the way to a tournament to lose an extra couple ounces to make weight. But I would say, too, that I was really extreme. Um, I think that I've always been kind of extreme with the diets that I followed and the way that I've managed my food almost to like a disordered extent. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, I have definitely learned a lot about my body and metabolism, um, which has helped me now, like a lot later on. Yeah, so instead of starving yourself and then carb loading, you would be, well, I would say um, fasting in a healthy way, and then when you did refeed after you weigh in, you would do more of um, eating high fat. And so you'd maintain your yeah. energy throughout the tournament as opposed to having that typical crash that the other wrestlers would have in the afternoon. Yeah. Do you feel like that helped you with that? I was able to maintain my energy pretty well. That's such an interesting experience that you had with being thrust into a sport that is so, you know, so much of it revolves around around nutrition and diet, and it's done in such a, uh, I would say, in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. um, so you really brought a new perspective to the sport in that time frame, which was when this was all very new, and hopefully. You taught your coach a lot about, about what's possible as well. Yeah, I don't know how much I taught my coach or even my other teammates, but there's so much, so many unhealthy practices in the world of athletics and fitness with just so many beverages out there and falsely or just misleading labels on packaged food and meal prepping and all that kind of a thing. Um, which I'm not hating on, but I think that there's a lot of misleading information out there. And for people who are really devoted to what they're doing are willing to try things that compromise their health without really knowing it because it seems to work for other people. But I think that keto is really easily adaptable to your lifestyle and to your body type and your habits and routines so that you can maintain your health instead of compromising it in order to like be successful. I believe if you do it correctly, it will simplify your life in the kitchen and it will make your life around food much easier and less stressful. And that is commonly the mis the misnomer that people think it's it, it is difficult to learn the the particular uh, practices and there's a way to do it right and there's a way to do it wrong where you won't get results, and if you're not getting results with it, there's probably something that you're doing wrong. Um, but once you fine tune it, and you really get to understand your biochemistry, it will definitely make your life easier in around food and in, in all matters, which has been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, so what? how was it for you to transition from high school and doing this with your sporting um, background, and then moving into a dorm room. How did you actually cope with that and trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle, which I know how difficult that is. I've never been very big. I think that a lot of my own interpretation of my weight is mental and psychological and just based around self-criticism, but I was really motivated to use the kitchen in my dorm and go to the gym. Um, going to the gym in the morning kind of saved me because sometimes it was just hard for me to get out of bed and hard for me to think about the next step. Um, but I had my morning routine and I ate mostly keto. And at that point I transitioned to doing it instead of for fitness, um, more for my brain because I was in school and I just saw a lot of people struggle with anxiety and stress and depression and uh, mental uh, disorders, I guess, because they couldn't handle school, family life, relationships, and yeah, it was just, just, just a lot. So I was really trying to go into a mode of protecting my brain and my body. <laughs> so you used it as a means to stay mentally focused and clear and to be able to study and learn better and did you notice a difference when you would sort of slip off the rails oh yeah yeah I was way more focused so in the morning I would just drink a smoothie and that gave me the time to go to the gym and to have tea and to sit with my roommate um, who I have a great relationship with I feel like um, she's one of my best friends from school and I think that that really had a lot to do with us spending time together in the morning um, and so yeah, I made a smoothie in the morning and then in the afternoon I would have a high fat snack, um, like a chia pudding or coconut milk, um, 
pudding of some kind or like a paleo wrap. Then have dinner later on and yeah, it made me super focused during the day. I don't know that it made me feel focused, but I was definitely a lot more focused and had more time to focus on my schoolwork um, and class time and wasn't distracted by breakfasty, like making breakfast or something. Um, and I mostly use the kitchen at my in my dorm instead of going every meal to the cafeteria. The the kitchen wasn't in your room though. No. It was down the hall and yeah. it was not always the most convenient thing to do, but no, you chose it was to do that. It was messy all the time, but um really I used the blender. I had a bullet in my dorm room. So I had a bullet and I had a drawer full of spices and superfoods and colostrum and mushroom powders and um, coconut protein oil. powders and a ton of coconut oil. Yeah, I ate a lot of coconut oil at that time because I knew it was good for my brain. Lots of chocolate. I ate tons of chocolate. Lots and of I've chocolate. never, something that I'm kind of proud of actually, I've never become addicted to coffee, which I saw as a huge thing in college. And I just did not want to get hooked on that because I figured I'd be hooked for the rest of my life. And if I needed it to get through college, then... I was just, I never wanted to become dependent on it. So I think that keto also helped me uh, avoid a caffeine addiction. And all the sport drinks, there's, that's a real popular in college. I bet you saw a lot of that going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, then like soda and stuff, because it's all sponsored. So the my school sells it. Energy drinks and whatnot. That's everywhere. I mean, Starbucks is on our campus. Well, and I think that that just starts you in your whole work life. A lot of people who drink coffee every single day. It's just part of their routine. I drink tea. I drink pu'er. And coffee works for me when I want to drink it. I drink it and I get a bunch of energy, get a bunch of work done, take a great poop. And, <laughs> and it works great, but I don't need it every day. That's awesome. Yeah, you. it sounds like you developed a really strong practice around your daily rituals and rhythms, which really helped to keep you centered and grounded during your day-to-day um, -day college routine, which is so difficult to do uh, for people anywhere that have home lives and whatnot. I mean, we all struggle with that. And so to hear a college student living in a dorm who was able to manage that as a way of staying focused kept me from going crazy. <laughs> yeah. We all need some type of daily rhythm and rituals to keep us from going crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Something that is good self-care, not something that everybody's doing, like coffee, but do something that you find fulfilling. The thing with coffee is it's such a big part of the of the keto world, if you will, quote unquote. But yeah, like bulletproof coffee and right. that kind of thing. Then it can be really used in a unhealthy way. Um, and people don't realize, and I see this every day in my practice, how detrimental it is to the sleep cycle and it becomes so habitual that you don't realize it subtle, subtly undermines your sleep quality so that when you do wake up the next day you didn't get very good sleep the night before and so then you wake up tired and then that perpetuates the need for more caffeine so this is a really really vicious cycle and then if you add to that putting MCT oil in your coffee to boost your energy and help you stay in ketosis, you're then adding a highly processed, very unhealthy oil to your coffee. So I am not at all a fan of MCT oil in coffee or in anything. I think it's devastating for the gut bacteria, for the gut microbe, uh, microbial pop population. And it is something that um, I do not advocate for at all. So if you're going to have coffee, uh, shift at least in your intention toward reducing the caffeine content. If you're feeling like you really need coffee in the morning, try moving to half calf and then to decaf. Um, it is a great vehicle for a healthy fat if you're using the right kind of fat in your coffee, such as coconut oil, maybe even heavy cream if you don't have any gut issues whatsoever. But if you do, then I would stick with coconut oil or ghee in your coffee. Okay, Ruby. So back to you and how are you doing so you've moved out of your dorm now you're senior in college yeah 
and you're now living by yourself in a tiny house, which is a restored school bus, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about your tiny house? So my tiny house uh, was built by Kalina, uh, my really good friend from childhood, and I've lived in it for a little over eight months, I want to say, so just all of last school year. Um, and it is my little sanctuary. I have my tea space set up in there and I have a small kitchen, shower, composting toilet. Um, and I live by myself and I have maintained the same diet pretty much all throughout college. Um, there were definitely times like when I was studying abroad and stuff that I changed my diet, but that was actually, keto was huge for when I was studying abroad because I think it's a really versatile diet so I could change up what I'm doing. Um, lets me still have fun, I guess, in a roundabout way. Can you, um, can you say more about that? So you, where did you go? Where did you study and what, how did you maintain this while you were there? Yeah, so, uh, well, so this is really like before I lived in the tiny house. I was in Granada, Spain, and their whole sleep an eating schedule is so different from over here. They don't eat, I mean, they eat a really small breakfast, um, like coffee and a piece of toast, and then a huge lunch and a pretty small dinner at 11 p.m. at night. <laughs> so I started fasting until 2 p.m. in the afternoon, which I hadn't ever really done before, and I would just drink tea in the morning and go to class and then come home and have a huge lunch and then have dinner late at night. And the first week that I was, first couple weeks I was studying abroad, adjusting to that diet was so difficult. I was so constipated and, um, and then just like with culture shock and stuff, I think I was, my digestion was off um, and just travel in general kind of does that. But once I adjusted, I felt awesome going out getting tapas and wine and beer and having just so much fun because I was intermittent fasting and I tried to stay as keto as I could so or like low carb so I wouldn't have bread or tried to stick with vegetables um really alcohol has probably been the biggest non-keto thing I've consumed over the years um but yeah and I just fast if I felt if I felt bad uh but it really I was also exercising and walking everywhere. I think I walked an average of five to seven miles a day. So that was a huge part of uh, my health then. Um, and then in, in school, like this last year when I was in the tiny house, I biked to school every morning. And that was a 12-minute bike. I think it's like a mile, a little over a mile. Uh, and that was part of like one of my favorite parts of the day. And then I also went to the gym and I've gone to the gym all throughout college. Even when I studied abroad, I got a gym membership. Um, so that was also helpful. So you do a lot of physical activity. You were really active in Spain. And so can you talk a little bit about the, the choices you made around um, alcohol consumption, which is obviously high in carbs, uh, the beer and wine, and then how you balance that out with, with intermittent fasting? Yes, yeah, so I just drink alcohol that was low in carbs and high in alcohol. But but if you did drink a carb alcohol like beer or wine, you would balance that out the next day with, with more fasting? Cause you... Yeah, no, I, I would extend my fasting or maybe not eat dinner so that I was closing in my window. Or if I knew that I would drink, I'd go for a run or something to try and get my ketones back up. I wasn't testing ketones, but I knew that they're there and I can kind of feel when I'm going in and out of ketosis. Uh, feel more clear-headed and energetic. That's usually the classic signs. If you're not testing your ketones, that's what you look for and that's what you start to notice over time, just intuitively how your body feels. So I did keto for 15 years and never tested my ketones mm. and just uh, intuitively would know. And then it wasn't until maybe three years ago that I started even using it ketone monitor, maybe even two years. So I've been doing keto-ish, in and out of keto for almost 20 years and never tested my ketones up until maybe two, three years ago. So there is certainly a way to learn from your body how it's responding to the food that you mm -hmm. eat. And before we had all these nifty gadgets, that's 
that's what we had to rely on. So it's, it's incredible that we have the tools that we do today to make this so much easier. And once you get in tune with your body and how it's responding and you see the numbers on the, on the uh, monitor and whatnot, and you see your macros, you'll begin to understand and intuitively know what's going on without having to, um, to keep diligent track every single day. Now, some people are gonna wanna do that anyway. I still have clients I work with that, that put everything they eat into a chronometer every day and they've done it for years and they never miss a day. I'm, I'm not so diligent, so mm -hmm. uh, I mainly go by how I feel and when I'm curious now, I'll, I'll test my ketones, but um, it's, it's not something that I do on a daily basis. So you will find what works for you and the combination of intermittent fasting and um, a low carb lifestyle is really the keys to successfully managing and maintaining your ideal body weight. Another thing that I noticed when I was in Spain is that I, I got my period back after not having it for almost four years. Um, and that's kind of a, a long story in and of itself. Uh, and I think it had a lot more, it had a lot to do with stress. And I've struggled a lot the last few years with stress and I think that when I was abroad, not only was my diet really um, going well as far as like being flexible, I was having fun, but also feeling healthy uh, and walking a lot, going to the gym, uh, occasionally going on runs. And then on top of that, feeling stress-free was huge. I think that uh, stress is actually one of the biggest deciding factors in where my body's at. Uh, and my period is a huge indicator for me because I know when I lose my period that I'm kind of, or when my period isn't regular, then something's up in my life, in my environment that's causing me to shut down. That's a really, really good point that you bring up, Ruby. Yes, stress ripples out into all the hormones. You can't have one hormone that's out of balance and not have every one of the hormones out of balance. So insulin is a major hormone as well, mm -hmm. which is usually the hormone that is most out of balance because people are eating a carbohydrate centric diet for the most part. And once that comes back into balance, everything can come to a, to a place of rest as well. It's kind of like pulling on one string of a mobile and all the, all the, all the bits move, you know, all the pieces move. So you can't pull on one string and not have it affect the entire whole system. So that's really important that you bring that up. And mm -hmm. it is such a hindrance for weight loss and people that are under severe uh, stress that are wondering why they can't lose weight. Um, that is one of the things that I talk about significantly at length in my coursework with my clients is helping them to manage stress. And there's some key components to doing that that cannot be left out or this will not work for anybody. So when people say, oh, I tried keto and it didn't work, first I wanna know what did they actually do? And second, of course, in addition to that, that's just as important is, is um, really looking at the stress and the stress level and how they're able to manage stress yeah, it should be a, it should be, it should not be a stressful thing right. to be eating well. Exactly. It is a lifestyle practice. It's not something you have to struggle through and then it's over and you're done. This is, this is a longer journey than that. If you're getting your diet together to maintain a healthy life, a healthy aging and optimal wellness throughout your life, it's a, it's a lifetime journey. This is not something that's going to come and go. Yeah. Well, and I think that that journey really comes with repairing your gut too. Um, I think that's another thing that about, uh, living in Spain and studying abroad also in Ecuador, as I started eating animal products after being vegan for two years mm. and started feeding my gut and started paying more attention to probiotics, uh, and eating fermented fermented foods, um, kefir, fermented dairy. And that really made a big difference too. So in the same conversation of hormones and 
that kind of extends into neurotransmitters and back into your environment, what you're being stimulated and triggered by and how you're responding to that. And your stress and your capacity yeah, to deal with it's your all mental stressors. Interconnected. So trying to lose weight is related to all of those things. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience with um keto with animal products versus keto without animal products and the differences and the changes that you noticed with each of those hmm. and how it may have also related to your menstrual cycles. When you weren't eating animal products, you didn't have a cycle. Yeah. And correct. then when you incorporated animal products, you got your period back. Is that um, yeah, for the most part. And then you went vegan again and you lost your period again and then you started eating animal products and your period came back again. Yeah, that's what happened. I just think that's such a good point to bring up, Ruby, because I see a lot of younger patients in the clinic and they have also lost their menstrual cycle. A lot of, um, you know, for ethical reasons nowadays, a lot of younger people are choosing to be vegan or vegetarian and it's affecting their hormones. It's affecting their reproduction. It's affecting their menstrual cycles, the women. And I think it's really important for, for everyone to hear that the animal products, although they may seem to be less environmentally friendly, there is a way that you can maintain a healthy diet and have animal products that are not destroying the environment. And that's the main thing that I want people to understand is that when you remove animal products, you're also cha completely changing the, the composition of your gut flora. And that is really one of the underlying factors of inflammation that leads to a lot of systemic issues and problems. So to get the hormones balanced, we have to look at how we're affecting the gut microbiome with the foods that we're eating. And so Animal products are tricky though, because I, w I was vegan because of environmental reasons and wanting to reduce my, wanting to reduce my ecological footprint. And I was super strictly vegan because of that. I also learned throughout being vegan that there's so many vegan foods that are not healthy at all for you, especially soy based foods or processed packaged food that's high in sugar processed sugar, um, grains, pastries, yeah, baked it's foods, a lot of grains, cakes. which is super hard on your gut. I think a vegan diet can be fantastic if you're needing raw, fresh, not necessarily raw, but a lot of plants and vegetables. You're trying to do more of a cleanse, pulling out toxins, but I think for the sake of rebuilding your gut, you need animal products. But then where that is tricky is that if you're getting animal products from a CAFO, concentrated animal feeding operation where the animals are fed hormones and antibiotics and grains, you'd be better off not eating those things. You'd be way better off being vegan. Uh, so I think that being vegan is very healthy for a majority of the population that are, you know, that are consuming unhealthy animal products. But I am super privileged for living in relatively small towns and having access to, um, farmers and people that don't raise their animals with antibiotics and hormones and their pasture raised. Uh, and I think that that's actually the most environmentally sustainable as well as if you're doing sustainable um, rangeland management, essentially it can be good for watersheds and local ecosystems, soil health, um, so I think if you have access to meat from a farmer's market or a local butcher, then by all means make broth and eat good high fat, high, or I guess like products high in animal fat. And um, yeah, like coming home, I have access to raw milk, raw goat's milk. And I, I can't imagine what would be better than that. It's such a potent medicine, I feel like, with how many probiotics are in there. What are you doing with your raw goat's milk, Ruby? I've been making kefir. Okay, yeah, awesome. That's great. Ghee is one of your healthy fats that you consume on a regular basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
whiskey, coconut oil, taco runner, um, chocolate. Chocolate is a fabulous staple. I don't know what I would do without chocolate in my life. I and make a lot of chocolate. And so how do you make your chocolate? So a lot of people will um, buy chocolate bars that mm -hmm. have sugar in them or maybe monk fruit or stevia, but they're really expensive. So if yeah. you ate as much chocolate as I do, you would be spending a fortune on chocolate bars. So I, I teach all of my clients how to make their own simple raw chocolate. And I follow your recipe. Awesome. I melt cacao butter and cacao paste in the double boiler and pour it into a um, small Pyrex and then put it in my freezer and have it for months, weeks, yeah. months, and put all kinds of different nuts or seeds or goji berries in it. And then... Um, what do you sweeten it with? A mixture of lohan and lucuma. Okay, so lohan guo is a Chinese medicinal herb, which is also known as monk fruit. So if you're listening and you're wondering what that is, uh, you can usually find it in most stores, most health food stores, and you can all certainly find it online, monk fruit, but it's also goes by the name of Lohan Guo, G-U-O. I believe that's how you spell it, Lohan. Um, so yeah, those are, those are great sweeteners. Those are safe sweeteners. Uh, stevia also, stevia extract is, is a great, safe, healthy, low glycemic sweetener that um, are the only sweeteners that I use and recommend because the other sugar alcohols are very disruptive to the gut bacteria and are not healthy choices for keto. So if you'll notice in a lot of the keto dessert recipes you'll see out there, <clears throat> they use um, the sugar alcohols and I just recommend that you substitute those for the healthy sweeteners that I, that I just mentioned because the other sweeteners will destroy your gut flora. Awesome. So Ruby, I'm so excited that you joined me for this, for this interview. And is there anything else that you might want to share with the world around your experience or anything that you think would be helpful or useful that you've learned? Yeah, I think, uh, the most important thing is personalizing how you eat to fit your lifestyle and to fit your own joy. Um, I think that that's really what's special about like the end of your program and the end of your course is that you talk about um, mastery and becoming the master of your own health. And I think that being able to observe yourself in your own patterns and know when you fast and when you feast and when you are maybe doing that out of um, out of a negative pattern or doing it out of a positive pattern, um, or at least I would guess like beneficial or harmful, um, and being really attuned to your life and what you're doing for your work and where you're spending your time and energy. Uh, those are all things that I've been thinking a lot about this summer, um, as well as how to embody my experiences so that I'm experiencing them differently, I guess, and not feeling so um, heady about them. Um, I think that you mean how, like practicing being more present? In yeah, your practicing being more present, practicing feeling my emotions more, practicing uh, just, yeah, accepting things as they come and being more um, proactive about how I handle things and being more decisive as well and trying to be at choice with my own attitude mm. towards things, um, especially towards myself and my body. I think that I'm, I'm more confident about my body now than I have been since seventh grade or eighth grade. And I think that I, I weigh the same. And I keep telling myself like the last few even a month, couple months ago, I would tell myself, like, if I only could lose 10 pounds or um, get back to how I was in high school or something. And I think that I've been holding on to that for a long time. And just in the last few months, I think through personalizing my diet, personalizing when I intermittent fast and personalizing the kinds of um, foods that I'm eating with some supplements uh, that I'm really coming to love my body and my body looks so much different than it did I think because I've been exercising more and doing um, aerial silks and aerial rope on a three times a week um, but just feeling differently about my body and I weigh exactly the same I weigh ex uh, to the 
point whatever like down to the ounce I weigh the same but I look a lot different uh, and I feel different and I think that that has a lot to do with keto cycling and how I personalize my diet um, and then I'm also doing things like I'm using a cannabis essential oil and I've been taking some myrrh every day um, so those are as those are examples of how I've kind of personalized little things that I'm doing on the side um, to help with systemic function of my body um, and then exercise and yeah do you is is are those things that you learned from my course that has helped you fine-tune your emotional awareness system and if so I think that it has to do because I'm familiar with all of your work. Um, I'm I know the ins and outs of every single one of your lessons and just all of your coursework. But I think that um, really it came down to my commitment and deciding that I do not want to live my life unhappy with the body that I'm in and that starts with taking accountability taking accountability of my health and my emotions and not blaming others not pointing fingers not holding on to aspects of my past um so that's all that's all been huge for me recently to come to where i'm at great ruby thank you for sharing that it's so important the entire first module of my course work begins with mindset and really looking at the inner dialogue and the how detached we are from <clears throat> actually inhabiting or being in our physical body most of us are not present most of the time um, and it's the awareness of how distant and how removed we are from our own experience that helps us get back into our body and helps us to understand how we can enjoy that experience again. And sometimes this hasn't been a joy for since we were children mm -hmm. and really bringing ourselves and our awareness back into our body is such a huge part of our healing journey. And I want to say something too to that. I think one big thing that really got me back into my body is doing solo journeys. Ah. So one of my favorite things is going out into the forest. Um, I guess if there were other landscapes around, I would enjoy those just the same. But I like going into the forest and fasting for a day or two days. The first time I ever went out and did a solar journey, I fast. I went out for four days and fasted. Um, and I, I derive so much meaning and personal growth. Um, as motivation for personal growth comes from my solo journeys. And I don't think that I would be, have the liberty um, and the power to go out and do that by myself and fast um, if I weren't familiar with keto uh, and confident in my body taking care of itself, uh, going through autophagy and, um, you know, going through the ups and downs of being being hungry uh, or being thirsty or whatever. I do drink water. I just go out with water, um, go out into the forest and try and get away from people and everything, all society and civilization <laughs> and just do yoga and journal uh, and try not to bring any stimulation or entertainment and go for walks. And that's something that's really brought me back into my body. Um, because I have so much time to myself to observe my thoughts. Uh, and I notice that I'm, I'm really sensitive to the people around me. So when I'm going, when I'm out by myself in the woods and there's nobody around, my whole mindset changes and all my thought process processes change. Um, and I didn't really know that. I didn't know that that would even happen the first time I went out, but I was shocked by it. And it became something that I, I felt like I, I needed to get back into myself and get reconnected to, to who I am and what really feeds me. That's so important. I'm so happy that you brought that up, Ruby. Um, going and connecting with nature is something that 
I talk a lot about in my book and in my coursework, and I recommend everybody uh, find their way back to nature because that is where we recharge our battery and reconnect and ground ourselves and really get clear and um, present and focused. And without that return to nature, we are so removed that our body is confused and it needs that connection. It's kind of like uh, tuning in your radio dial to the frequency that feeds your soul. And without that, uh, you know, living in cities and hustle and bustle and, and not ever touching the earth, we get really spun out. And this is such a, such a vital part of res health restoration. So I'm really glad that you brought that up, Ruby. Thank you so much for, for adding that. Um, yeah, thank you for being my guest today. I'm going to wrap this up because this is this has uh, been a lot of, of great information and, and we could keep going, but we'll stop here. So again, thank you so much for joining me, everyone, and listening to this amazing interview with Ruby. Um, this is the Ketogenic Diet Show. I'm Mary Beauchamp, registered nurse, therapeutic nutritionist, also a GAPS certified practitioner. GAP stands for Gut and Psychology Syndrome. This was brought to the U.S. by Dr. Natasha Campbell many, many years ago before the gut-brain connection was ever mainstream. So if you want to know more about the gut healing protocol that I talk about in my work, it came from uh, GAP's Gut and Psychology Syndrome, the book by Natasha Campbell. And I highly recommend her, her book to anybody who might be struggling with psychological issues, autism, schizophrenia, uh, anxiety, all of that is covered in, in her book. So thank you again for joining me. Have a wonderful day. You can find me at www.ketogenicdietcoach.com.